So the things that you would be monitoring to accomplish this, you can imagine, you know, so are you doing the trial you intended and is it feasible? You're going to monitor various logistics like enrollments, um, baseline data, comparability of the arms, protocol compliance. You know, a lot of times um, people have visit windows that are impossible. Like everyone should come in plus or minus one day of their anniversary. Like, um, when you wind up with 90% of your data in violation of the protocol, you rethink the protocol. <laughs> um, specimen collection, is it being accomplished? Are your, is your data complete? And is the quality um, in terms of, um, generally these um, databases are independently monitored from the sense of a data monitor comparing source documentation with what's actually in the database. And those kinds of statistics would also very potentially be reported to a DSMB. And ultimately, so you would, you, know, you would agree on, say, these sorts of, these will be the logistics that the DSMB will keep an eye on, and the sponsor participates in that conversation of what they want to be monitored or considered by the DSMB. And it's generally best to think in advance about specific benchmarks that you'll start to think about will be concerning. Um, obviously, you'll be monitoring outcomes, such as adverse events, interim, interim variables. You know, if this is a trial for vaccine efficacy, and it might be a while, say if it's HIV prevention, um, it might be a while to get trial results. You can certainly look at the immunogenicity. You might expect if this vaccine is working that certain um, immune markers should be elevated, right? So if early on, you know, it's all flatlined, and you're also getting evidence of very similar um, event rates in the groups, and there's no evidence that this, there's immunogenicity of this vaccine, and this could be something that would... Um, give early signs that there could be an issue with futility. And finally, um, if agreed in advance, you might be also actually monitoring your primary endpoint. Again, to see if you can, if you can stop early and the patients are best served, if you can answer your question more quickly than, and, then, than, and convincingly, then do that. Um, so who monitors a trial? I mean, so... You know, data safety monitoring is a very generic term in some sense. You're going to have many ethical committees next week. You'll hear about IRBs or one of the next lectures. Um, the sponsor is going to want to keep an eye on things, say, from a general um, perspective of accrual or uh, certain serious adverse events are always reported to the FDA, to the sponsor, to the investigator if they're serious. So many folks are, um, are looking at, there's a safety monitor, they're looking at the patient's safety from different perspectives. But I would say it is unique responsibility of the Data and Safety Monitoring Board to have that, um, that goal of, of looking at potentially at the uh, efficacy. In fact, they're the only ones that should be looking at efficacy in a blinded trial. Otherwise, it's not a blinded trial. And so they have basically the unique responsibility of being able to look at the totality of evidence. And that's what makes them so important. So remember, their purpose is to look at, um, at a, that regular interim looks at the data. They need to provide an objective assessment of whether or not they're on track to continue or whether there's reasons to stop. And they need to keep everything that they've learned completely confidential and out of the hands of the sponsor and out of the hands of the investigator because if the idea is the trial should continue as planned as a blinded trial um, with equipoise, then nothing should be leaked. Um, and that sometimes is difficult to accomplish. Um, so, you know, generally accepted that, you know, think about if those are the goals, um, when you're forming these DSMBs, you realize they should be multidisciplinary in order to sort of be that scientific guide, that statistical guide, that ethical guide. Um, they need to also have a well-defined charter, set of roles and responsibilities. Um, they need to be free of conflicts of interest, and they need to be people that understand and protect confidentiality. Um, and I think just because it's so important, I want to just emphasize, you know, why confidentiality is so important, why, um, you know, they can't just leak some kind of summary of what, how the trial is doing so far with efficacy, and that goes back to why we blind trials, right? So if you had some idea of how the how this treatment was doing. It may affect what kinds of patients you enroll. It may affect the care of the patient, um, whether you think they're suddenly more at risk or doing well, or um, how you assess patients. Maybe you're hunting around for a certain kind of response, and it might make a sponsor nervous. And these could all be just streaks in the data that weren't statistically 
um, convincing at all. You don't want any of that spuriously influencing um, you, uh, how we conduct the trial, which hopefully is completely objectively just randomizing patients to different arms and evaluating them all the same way to get a reliable answer at the end. So if partial knowledge of interim data gets out to people that are, that are enrolling patients or recording data, I think I strongly believe it could muddy the waters. And so um, really uh, no interim efficacy should be, should be revealed. Um, and I think that's why there's so much emphasis on independence. So not only to maintain ob objectivity, but you can imagine if a member of the DSMB is the best friend of the protocol investigator or a spouse or of someone involved in the trial, you know, our research worlds are quite small. It could be almost impossible to, um, I think, be immune to that pressure or to just have it um, be in situations that are unexpectedly compromising. And so if for that reason alone, having people that don't have contact very really with the protocol team is an easy way to remain, you know, basically a, a firm boundary between those protected information and those that should not have that information. Um, and, and generally also just to maintain that uh, there, as you'll see, as you read, if you read more case uh, examples, that this data can get very murky. And so you don't want anything um, to influence you other than the data itself in terms of being invested for the result to go one way or the other. So you, you consider that when you establish a committee. You know, it, is, it is generally appointed by the sponsor. They, you know, they want this study to be a success. They're going to be looking for clinicians of the appropriate specialty. They'll be looking for statisticians, uh, you know, without exception if there's going to be monitoring boundaries and um, statistically technical um, analyses to be evaluated. You need people to consume that data and people to present that data. Um, there could be ethicists, particularly in trials um, of vulnerable populations. Um, there could be subject advocates. Um, and there's always an executive secretary in the end who makes sure that this, this meeting is run, that the charter is followed, that minutes are taken. And it's a very formal responsibility. Um, and membership needs to be acceptable to the trial leadership because they have to trust this board. Um, and a fundamental principle is that no one on the protocol team is a member, or certainly not a voting member, of the DSMB. Um, interestingly enough, there are differences of opinion on whether or not the study sponsor can be on the DSMB. Um, there's a guidance from the FDA that says sponsors should not be part of the DSMB. There should be no member from the study sponsor on the DSMB. Um, however, at NIH, the perspective at many institutes, not all of them, but at many institutes, is that they serve the public. They're not financially invested in the sense of profiting from these trials individually. Um, you know, it's a not-for-profit research organization. And so uh, it, the public is best served if they are members. They are the experts in these fields and in running these trials. And they are an advocate for the public. So what's interesting is, is something as integral, as important as the DSMB, um, there's actually still quite a bit of wrangling over the best way to do these things. And there's probably not a one-size-fits-all. I think that's, that's something everyone can agree on. The meetings um, generally have a recommended structure or a typical structure in any case that you would have an open session where you process the data. You know, the sponsor, the inv investigators are summarizing um, the trial, the accrual, um, and some you know, unprotected information about how things are going. There are often site representatives there, and they're, you know, they're discussing data quality. Um, and then there will be a closed session in which the, the investigative team, the protocol team, um, people running the trial would all leave. And that would be when you, might, you would essentially be presenting data by arm, certainly any unblended data. Certain types of AEs um, are indicative of that, you know, that belongs to certain kinds of treatments. So if you knew that AE rate, you'd, you'd understand how people are doing on a particular arm. Those kinds of... Um, data tables would be reserved for the closed session. Um, there typically needs to be someone who has access to the study data and, uh, and the unblinded study data that is often going to have to be a statistician that somehow um, is, is there sort of at, say, at NIH or at the, at the group that's doing the trial. And so there's various ways that you have an independent statistician that's associated with the study but at the same time has no contact um, with the study team to, to maintain that confidentiality. 
and um, blindedness of the, of the study investigators. Now you can see this is quite a complex endeavor, almost a little bit of cloak and daggers. Um, and then finally, uh, there'll be an executive session. So generally you do need a data expert that is in some way affiliated with that sponsor and that study. Um, but after they present the data, they're, they're done. You know, oftentimes it's a statistician who they believe even um, when they belong to a, a group, you know, sort of Spock-like in their lack of preference for how things go and they only care about the numbers. But they're finally asked to leave as well. And then the executive session should only be the DSMB members that vote that are truly what we consider those objective members. And then they discuss the totality of evidence and any recommendations that they feel they need to make about this trial, which is to continue as is, or if they feel there are modifications or reasons to stop. Um, you know, there can be special requests to have someone come back in to discuss an item. Obviously, this is a, in some ways there's structure, in other ways there's unstructure, in the sense that every trial can present a different challenge. Um, and so the scope of the, the responsibilities for the DSMB um, is that they're going to evaluate this accumulating data with respect to toxicity, right? They're going to think about potential efficacy and or futility. They'll be looking at risk benefits um, or potentially um, the complete lack of um, expectation that, uh, that there could be any positive result at the end. So they can recommend, you know, after that totality of evidence, terminating or continuing um, if they're concerned about accrual or other um, issues potentially um, a certain AE that they're concerned about, they might, they might want to see more data. And how they make those requests can sometimes give signals, so they might only make those requests to that independent statistician and not to the team as a whole. Even that has a little bit of um, structure that's uh, delicate. Um, and, and finally, um, they might ask either for the next time, if they don't think it's really a hurry, you know, just something that would be more helpful next time, but they might ask for additional analyses than what was initially anticipated. They, just, they basically have full reign to ask for what they need to do their job. 